I'm Emily Chang, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, SoftBank's $100 billion vision fund nears completion after closing a funding round in Saudi Arabia. What Masayoshi Son's childhood dream means for Silicon Valley and the U.S. tech landscape. Plus, Ford kickstarts its focus on ride sharing and self driving with a surprise shakeup in the C suite. What new CEO Jim Hackett brings to the table. And the market's most valuable player is on track to become the world's first $1 trillion company. This, according to one Apple analyst, we'll catch up with him ahead. First, to our lead. SoftBank's Masayoshi Son formally announces the first round of capital commitments for his long awaited tech investment fund with more than $93 billion in the coffers. Backers include the Saudi Public Investment Fund, as well as Apple, Foxconn, and Sharp. The Vision Fund is expected to top $100 billion in six months' time and will focus on startups in the United States. For more now, we're joined by our Bloomberg editor-at-large, Corey Johnson. So, Corey, first of all, this gives effectively Masayoshi Son the biggest fund in all of tech. What does that mean? Yeah, the biggest fund in all of tech. I mean, it's it's uh, it's sort of hard to imagine how uh, such a fund, not quite the hundred billion dollars that they announced it was going to be, but even ninety-three billion, how that can be effectively used, right? I mean, uh, startups require less and less cash uh, outside of the world of biotech, but require less and less cash uh, in the early days of funding, and so just finding deals, let alone uh, nurturing those deals, uh, is going to be hard to do. Now, interestingly, this is it's not all cash going into the fund. Their stake in in Arm Holdings, a, a big and and uh, long-standing uh, semiconductor fund uh, is part of the contribution to this, this fund, but nonetheless, it's, a, it's a, just a giant behemoth of a fund that will probably be hard to manage. Now, uh, there's been a lot of speculation about why it took so long to raise the fund. What do we know about that? I've been trying to raise $100 billion for a very long time, and um, <laughs> it's taken me, it's, and, and, and they, they, they beat me to it. So, you know, it's all relative. I, I think raising the largest uh, venture capital fund in the history of finance uh, is sort of an amazing feat, especially given that the track record of, of these guys as, as an investors outside of the, the work at SoftBank, and SoftBank has nurtured many companies, but uh, uh, it's, it's a new structure for a new kind of fund. So I, I think really that uh, maybe the announcements were a little bit premature, but the goal was uh, uh, astronomical in terms of its ambition just to raise the money, but to put the money to use is a whole different ticket. The other question out there is going to be, what are the fees going to be like for this fund? Are they really going to go two and 20 with this fund? Or, or, or will the fee structure be very different? Because they'll be sitting on a lot of cash for a very long time uh, before they put the money to work. Now, we've talked a lot about that meeting between President Trump and Masayoshi Son, where Masa said that a lot of this money would be going towards tech innovation in the United States, will create jobs in the United States. How much economic opportunity do you think this can really create here in the U.S.? Well, I think it's curious where the, the money is going to be invested, and we don't really have an, a notion of that. The, the sums are so large suggest that uh, SoftBank might have entree to certain deals that others would not. And so the, the real question is, uh, where is the money going to be invested? Is it going to be invested in the U.S. or beyond? With this much money at play and the notion that it's going to be focused on technology, one might imagine it will be invested globally, uh, not just in the U.S., but certainly some portion of it definitely in the U.S. because it would be hard not to. All right, Corey Johnson, our editor at large, uh, with more context there on the Vision Fund. Thank you so much, Corey. Uh, now, with more reaction to the SoftBank news and a larger perspective on tech investing, we're joined by Dr. Kaifu Li, one of the most prominent tech investors in China, the founder and CEO of Cinovation Ventures, also who has held executive positions at Apple, Microsoft, and of course led Google China. Kaifu, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. Thank you, Emily. So, what does a hundred billion new dollars in potential money going into tech mean uh -huh. for the tech investing landscape. How is this going to shake up the competition? Well, we are an earlier stage investor in Series A and B, and we're, we usually manage funds in the hundreds of millions of dollars. We began investing in AI and related technologies four years ago, and we are actually strong believers also that the future of uh, technology is great, the age of AI is coming, so we're very m much looking forward to SoftBank being a later stage investor in some of the companies that we and other um, venture capitalists have built up. A lot of this is supposedly going towards AI and AI investments, which we're going to talk about, but I'm curious, yeah. could it be too much? I mean, are there enough opportunities out there to warrant $100 billion? 
I think there certainly can be uh, deals like that. I think they've already invested in DD, as an example. That's, that's one of the Chinese companies uh, raising on the order of five to ten billion dollars. So if you think about uh, finding another 20 companies like that, the money will be used up before you know it. Where do you think the most competitive AI investments are right now? The top technologies are still in the U.S. and Canada. But I think China is coming up strong because of the large market and a large base of uh, AI knowledgeable people. 43% of the top publications are written by Chinese authors. And China's large market will create a lot of data. And AI is driven by brains plus data. So China is uh, coming up strong. Currently, I would say number two, but uh, with a good shot of uh, becoming one of the two superpowers in AI. You gave a fascinating commencement address at Columbia where you talked about AI and what it means for jobs. You said, right. in the next 10 years, all financial companies will be turned upside down with AI replacing traders, bankers, accountants, research analysts, insurance companies. Last year, my AI investment algorithm returned eight times more than my private banker. That reminds me, when I go home, I'm going to fire my private banker. Uh, you I hope he's not watching this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's been shaking in his boots since oh, yeah. you said that. Uh, you go on to say that you think simple jobs like factory workers and assistants will also get replaced, but even more yeah. complex jobs, doctors, teachers, reporters. Who still has a job in this brave new world? Well, I think the creators will have a job. The creators in technology, science, but also art, uh, entertainment. So that's a significant portion. And I think people who are in service industries, who deal with social aspects of service, you know, uh, that will actually be a set of jobs we have to create. See, unlike in the industrial revolution, where a set of jobs are gone, another set came about through assembly line, uh, this time we have to deliberately create these jobs that relate to social aspects because AI is no good at dealing with people to people. Mm -hmm. So do you see hordes of unemployed people or do you think those people will get other jo new jobs that have yet to be created? Uh, well, I think first there has to be uh, a way to redistribute the wealth created to ensure some kind of uh, social welfare and minimum stipend for the people who are displaced. And it's going to take time for some amount of retraining. And I think, re I think if people are open and inclined uh, to be retrained in the social aspect of the job, say uh, bar uh, bartender, masseuse, uh, tour guide, uh, and, job and concierge, and jobs like that, that will be on the rise for the people-to-people -people interaction. Tech giants from Facebook to Google, IBM to Microsoft have claimed they're working on AI. They're at the front end of the AI revolution. Who really is in the lead? I think clearly Google is in the lead. Uh, with the latest release of TensorFlow, uh, they're bringing the technology closer than ever to an average engineer to just with uh, you know maybe six months learning to be able to do something with AI. And I think uh, reducing that our learning curve is important and they're in the lead. But it doesn't mean everyone will just automatically use it because I think the other giants are working hard. And also, I really hope the open source community will come up with a more open solution than the giants, because then we become captivated by their entire ecosystem. And I think that's not good for innovation, nor is it good for the academics to be able to do work on top of open platforms. So if Google's in the lead, who's behind? I think uh, Facebook is doing well. <laughs> uh, Amazon's doing well. Uh, Microsoft's doing well. In China, Baidu, Tencent, Alibaba are doing well. What about the, Apple? Apple just uh, made their most recent hire to head up AI. And I think they should have every reason to do well, given they have a closed ecosystem that can pump data and learn so much about their users. But they uh, started behind. OK. Last question, where do you think you'll be placing your bets? Uh, in the financial industry. Uh, our Big, our, our most successful investment in AI right now is in a company that underwrote 30 million loans uh, th this year. It's underwriting 30 million, million loans in this year. And I think in insurance, banking, investment, we're long term very optimistic about uh, uh, autonomous vehicles as well as robotics. And your private banker is out of a job. All right, Kai Fu Lee, Innovation Ventures, always great to have you here, Kai Thank Fu Thank you. On the show. Thank you.
A story we are watching, Lei Echo's founder, Jiao Yue Ting, is stepping down from day-to-day -day operations of the online streaming service. Jiao will remain chairman of the company. Lei Echo has grappled with a cash squeeze in the last few months, leading to challenges in fundraising and unpaid bills. Coming up, it is a major CEO shakeup at Ford. What it means for the company's self-driving car ambitions, next. And Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. A surprise shakeup at Ford. Mark Fields is out after less than three years as CEO. Shares of the number two automaker in the U.S. fell 37 percent during his time in office. The new chief executive, Jim Hackett, who's been leading Ford's initiatives in self-driving cars in ride sharing, is in. Hackett revived office furniture maker Steelcase during 20 years as CEO there. Ford executive chairman Bill Ford spoke to Bloomberg TV and believes Hackett can do the same thing at the automaker. And I've never seen such a time uh, in our industry where technology and competitors and everything is converging to drive uh, real change. It's very helpful in, in, in a time like that to have a, a leader who's very experienced in driving transformational change. And fortunately, we have that in Jim Hackett. Joining us now, Bloomberg's Detroit Bureau Chief David Welch. So, David, what did Fields do wrong, especially when it comes to self-driving cars? And what do they think Hackett can do better? Well, the main thing that, that really hurt Fields was the stock price has been down so much. Their earnings have been down. They've been pulling in their forecasts while General Motors has been raising its forecasts. This is common. Toyota's been doing this, too, because the auto market is peaking. But you're not seeing many of the big company stocks down quite as much, and the board felt a lot of pressure. Then when you look at the self-driving car side of the business, they really didn't have a clear direction or mission. I think those are questions that the board wanted answered. In the case of GM and others, you've got business units they've acquired. GM has cruise automation. They're testing cars in San Francisco. They have a piece of ride-sharing company, Lyft, and they're, they're actually trying to experimenting with putting those in the fleet. So they, they have some clear things that they want to do with this. They have their own business maven. Ford doesn't really have any of that stuff quite as clearly laid out and, and in process. And I think they wanted some direction there. Are we expecting job cuts then at Ford? Well, they already announced that they were going to cut 10% of the, uh, the, the salaried staff globally. I don't know if they're, that they're going to be cutting more. Costs have gone up in the past year, actually two years at Ford, so you could see more. I think the new CEO is going to get in there. He's going to look at the executive team. He's going to look at costs. So you could expect there'll be more executive changes, and there might be some more cutbacks as well. One of the big questions is whether Ford can catch up to some of the more forward-looking automakers like Tesla. Uh, sticking with auto news, battery-making gigafactories are about to arrive in Europe. This is a term that was coined by Elon Musk, but now Daimler wants a piece of the pie. Uh, Caroline Hyde joins us now with more live from London. Caroline, what exactly do we know about the European gigafactories that are coming? Well, they're all pushing in the same direction. This is why Daimler, the maker of Mercedes-Benz, the Maybach in America, this is why they broke ground on a half a billion euro plant today. Big fanfare. Angela Merkel, the leader of Germany, was there. And it's all about seeing not only the auto sector push towards the battery trend, but so too the utility sector as well. Both of these juggernauts of industry groups really looking to capitalize mainly, Emily, on the falling cost of energy storage. This all becomes basically a bit of a virtuous circle as car makers such as Daimler, such as rival Volkswagen want to get into the greener energy types of cars. Meanwhile, the likes of the utility makers like Enel in Italy and, and other makers in Finland and Sweden are looking to basically be able to store renewable energy sources better via batteries such as solar and wind power. All of them are pushing in the same direction. They're going to produce more batteries, thereby pushing down the cost and making the whole economy of the whole thing even better and better and therefore a more virtuous circle. This is why we're seeing the likes of Daimler get in. This is why BNEF, this is the Bloomberg New Energy Finance researchers have said, look, battery costs could fall 43% in the next four years. This makes electric vehicles perhaps cheaper than normal vehicles as soon as 2023. David, are we thinking that gigafactories will pop up from more automakers? 
Yeah, look, you're seeing uh, forecasts of, of uh, lithium-ion battery production tripling by 2021, and you're seeing a lot of, uh, there are plans for a lot of cars coming out, particularly from the German automakers. And, and you look at the one that was just announced today, uh, that's Daimler. If I'm Daimler, I sell commercial trucks and luxury cars. What is Elon Musk making? He's making electric luxury cars, and he's planning on commercial trucks. So he's got a target on Daimler's back, and they want to do something about it. So they're going to put some, some new vehicles out. Uh, BMW, through its Audi division, will be uh, putting out some electric cars. Porsche plans to. Every automaker has to do it for regulation, but a lot of them are seeing that Tesla has some cool cars out there. And toward the end of the decade, we're going to see a lot of electric cars coming to market, and that's where all these batteries are going to go into. Caroline, will Daimler be able to catch up to Tesla? Is that the question here? That's the key question. They've got a lot of, as you say, models coming out. And what's notable is, well, they've got to please their own politicians. Merkel of Germany has said, look, by 2030, we want to see 6 million electric vehicles on the road. So they've got to please their own governments at the moment. They've got targets of their own. And, and it looks as though we could see about one-fifth of all new cars sold by 2030 actually being those electric vehicles. The way you take it on is by making the battery itself more economical. And if we are going to see that cost slashed by some 40%, that's the main cost of the car that you're producing. So suddenly that becomes a lot more cheap and therefore more people are willing to buy this. And I think it's interesting, therefore, we are going to see VW get in on it, Daimler get in on it, but also we're likely to see Europe, which has a pathetic market share in battery making, just 2.5%. The region wants to double that at least. They want to try and make ends meet and, and really trying to take on the likes of Tesla in America, but also China and Asia, which actually dominates battery making. All right, Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde live in London. David Welch with us there from Detroit. Thank you both. Uh, another story out of Europe today, the European Union is investigating General Electric for possibly providing misleading information during a merger review. According to people familiar with the case, regulators are looking into whether GE misled EU officials examining a deal to buy LM Wind Power. GE hasn't commented on the news. Last week, the EU fined Facebook $124 million for misleading behavior related to the purchase of WhatsApp. Coming up, how good has President Trump been for media companies? We'll pose that question to New York Times President and CEO Mark Thompson next. And a feature I just want you to check out, our new interactive TV Go function. You can find it at TV Go on the Bloomberg. You can watch us live. If you miss an interview, you can go back and check it out. You can send our producers a message, ask a question. You can play along with the charts we bring to you on air. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Check it out at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. CBS has signed Chairman and CEO Les Moonves to a new multi-year contract through 2021. Moonves will continue receiving his $3.5 million annual salary, plus long-term performance-based incentives. He is one of the nation's highest-paid executives, having earned over $69 million in 2016. Once the contract expires, Moonves has the option to become a senior advisor, as well as form a production company through the network. Staying in media, the New York Times has been making news, both with its own scoops, but also as a target of President Trump. Bloomberg's David Gura caught up with President and CEO Mark Thompson at the J.P. Morgan Tech Media and Telecom Conference in Boston, where they discussed the Times' partnership with social media platforms and the changing landscape of the news industry. We still have a partnership, a multi multifaceted partnership with Facebook and with Google and with Snapchat and, and so on. But I think we're all experimenting and experimenting with them. What's the best way of getting journalism to people? I think the major digital platforms are now asking themselves some quite searching questions about truth and falsehood and about their, their responsibilities when it comes to journalism. And we're very happy to, to work with them. Um, at the same time, because we want that deep relationship with our readers, in the end, the best place we think for enjoying the New York Times is on our, our, our own digital destinations, just as it always has been with our physical newspaper. Let me ask you lastly here about yeah. this, uh, I'll say, lovely rivalry shaping up between you and the Washington Post when it comes to cover politics yeah. in particular, and you guys are having fun with each other, breaking soups back and forth and, and whatnot. Is what you're doing replicatable at other newspapers? What do you admire about the way that the Washington Post is doing business at this point? Oh, I think, I, I think the Washington Post, um, I mean, 
that the, you know that story is the story they have to get right. It's, the, it's that's the, well, the New York Times has many things, has national coverage, has national coverage, great coverage of the arts. The New York Times is a much broader provider of news. But on that story, that's the Washington Post's home ground, and we're we're, we're very happy to uh, take part in the duel every day. And I, I would say that I think it's a really exciting time to be a journalist. It feels very important to be in journalism right now. And actually, part of what's great is seeing outstanding journalists competing with each other, not not in a kind of underhand or cynical way, but to get great stories. That's, I think it's what, what's making this such a wonderful period for journalism. That was New York Times President and CEO Mark Thompson there with our own David Gura. Coming up, Apple is on its way to achieving a $1 trillion market cap. So says one analyst. We will speak to him next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. Former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn may have lied in his application for a security clearance. That is according to Democratic Congressman Elijah Cummings, who says documents appear to indicate Flynn lied to investigators in 2016. The AP is reporting Flynn will invoke his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. Brazil's top court has suspended scheduling a ruling on President Michel Temer, who is accused of endorsing the payment of hush money to a jailed former lawmaker. The allegation represents a potentially significant blow for Temer, whose administration has lurched from one crisis to another since he took office just over one year ago. The EU has signed off on a tough Brexit negotiating stance. Negotiators plan to maintain a hard line on the UK's departure bill and won't discuss a future trading arrangement until there's an agreement on other key issues. Health and Human Services Secretary Tom Price says the U.S. is disappointed Taiwan wasn't invited to the WHO's key annual meeting. It's been invited as an observer to the World Health Assembly the late last eight years. Beijing accuses Taiwan's year-old government of not accepting the One China principle. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti. This is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. Monday here in Washington, 7.30 Tuesday morning now in Sydney. We are joined by Bloomberg's Paul Allen with a look at the markets. Paul, some gains here in the States. Good morning. Good morning, Elisa, and that could uh, translate into some gains here in Australia too. ASX futures pointing up two tenths of one percent right now. Uh, Rio Tinto has announced it intends to buy back two and a half billion dollars worth of bonds. Uh, this is an effort to trim debt and to combat recent downturns in commodity prices. Uh, over in Japan, we're seeing uh, very modest gains on the uh, Nikkei futures at the moment. Uh, Sony will hold an investor relations day today. This is in the last year of its midterm plan. Now, in the Five years since the CEO Kazuo Hirai was appointed, uh, Sony has outperformed the Nikkei. Stock prices almost doubling, a uh, headcount coming down by 37,000, and a uh, profit returning to the electronics giant. A few other things to watch out for today earnings from Kingsoft Corporation and Technology One. And on the data front, we will have Japan machine tool orders and CPI numbers out of Singapore. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next.
with technology, I'm Emily Chang. Let's get back to our lead. Japan's SoftBank announced it's closed the first round of its long-awaited vision fund, raising $93 billion. The fund will invest globally in both private and public tech companies. Peter Elstrom, our managing editor for Tech in Asia, joins us from Tokyo with more. And Peter, you've been doing some reporting on this. What is the latest we know about what it took to get these deals closed? Well, it did take a long time. SoftBank originally announced this deal back in October of last year. It came from a meeting between Masayoshi Son and the Deputy Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia the month before. And after many months of waiting and anticipating that it was going to close, it did close. They didn't quite get to the full $100 billion, but they got to $93 billion, a record for the tech fund. So the cornerstone investors are SoftBank itself and then the Saudi Arabia Sovereign Wealth Fund. Uh, Abu Dhabi has also put in money as well as Apple, Qualcomm, Foxconn, and some others. One name that we did hear early on that didn't show up in the press release was Larry Ellison of Oracle. It's not clear whether uh, he's going to come in at a later round or whether he's not going to participate. Talk to us about Masa Sun's vision for the fund as we know it now. Well, uh, Son has never been uh, shy about his ambitions. He talks about a 300-year plan for the company. He wants it to last well beyond uh, his, own, his own investments. And he's already cut very, very big deals. Uh, remember, he put $5 billion into Didi, the ride-hailing company in China, as part of a $5.5 billion round. It's the biggest venture round ever. And now he has even more capital to be able to deploy it. Uh, he's talked several times about the opportunities that he sees. He's had some big investment successes in the past, including Alibaba and Yahoo before that. He thinks that now there are be even better opportunities than in the past, and he wants to be able to use this capital to go after them in artificial intelligence, in the Internet of Things, and other kind of cutting-edge technologies, as well as some of these sharing economy uh, investments that he's made so far. So talk to us a little bit more about, more about what what we know about where this money is going to be invested next. We know about DD. What else? Well, uh, Masayoshi Son is going to be the key person on the investment committee. So it will be an extension of SoftBank in some senses. Uh, they are going to focus on some of these areas. One of the big surprising bets last year uh, was uh, the, the acquisition of ARM, the chip design company. Uh, Son said that he sees that as a gateway into the Internet of Things where they'll be able to collaborate in different, other, different areas uh, of technology. Ride hailing has certainly been a big focus, not just with Didi, but with some other investments, including Grab and Southeast Asia. Uh, so there, there are a number of these areas, and, and Masa is one to pull surprises out, too. So there certainly will be at least one or two surprises on the horizon. All right. Peter Elstra, I'm with Bloomberg in Tokyo. Peter, thanks so much for that update. RBC analyst Amit Daryanani says Apple has the potential to achieve a $1 trillion market cap and could even surpass that over the next 12 to 18 months. He joins me now here in the studio with his new call. So how much of this is related to the iPhone? How much of this is related to expectations around potential cash coming back from overseas? Uh, you know, so fascinating enough, I think the two things that can get you there largely, one is the new iPhone, the higher ASPs that you get, and the second is just continuing the buyback program that they have. If repatriation happens, it could probably be an upside lever to the numbers we have laid out. So nothing to do with the trillion dollar roadmap includes repatriation at this point from our perspective. Can the iPhone 8 disappoint? If so, how? Wow. Is, uh, is it possible? Uh, you know, the, the one way it disappoints, candidly, is maybe two ways. Expectations are very high. I mean, these are almost more lofty than you even had with the iPhone 6 several years ago. Uh, the second would be if this phone is really priced at a $1,000 ASP, um, are there really that many buyers out there for a $1,000 product? So I'd say those are the two things you want to watch for. Uh, exactly, and global smartphone growth is, is not looking great. I mean, IDC is forecasting 4.2% growth from last year to this year. Do you think the iPhone can beat that? We, we think it does, and, and here's why it does, right? Um, there's about a 750 million iPhone install base out there today. About 300 million of them have an iPhone 6 phone or older. Um, so we think the upside you get with iPhones is really driven by the install base churning over, given the fact it's three years old. And secondly, the ASP should be much higher with this phone. Now, I want you to take a look at this chart on the Bloomberg. Miller Tabak is out with some new analysis that shows the momentum around tech stocks mm -hmm. is reflective of late 90s levels. And I wonder, could we be headed toward a bubble? Could Apple specifically be in for a correction? Wow. Uh, 
you know, what I would say on Apple, at least, if you look at Apple's valuation, it really hasn't changed much <clears throat> in the last three years. Apple's kind of sitting at the same valuation bandwidth the way it did with the iPhone 6 launch. Um, I wonder if the tech bubble dynamic has more to do with the social media internet stocks versus Apple itself. Um, so I would actually argue if you do have a correction, Apple may prove to be very defensive, much as IBM was in the 0809 cycle for tech stocks. What about China? Will we expect an iPhone rebound there? Uh, it, for this all to work, yes, you need an iPhone rebound in China. And, again, and yes, I mean, it's going to happen? <laughs> China has the same replacement dynamic going on as the US does, which is the phones are fairly old. If iPhone X is really that innovative of a product, which you think it is, I think you do have the reversal of fortune in China as well. Now, the vast majority of analysts do have a buy rating on Apple, so you are not alone. That said, uh, you know, is this growth sustainable without a new product category? Tim Cook has said the services business is going to grow by leaps and bounds, but do they need a new product category? Over time, yes, they do. I mean, the reality with Apple stock is it lives and it dies by iPhone units over time. This is kind of nice because you're sitting in the upswing of iPhone units, but if you have this discussion in nine months and talk about what's next, the answer is there's nothing next other than the next iPhone. Uh, so that narrative needs to change at some point for the valuation to actually start going higher. And here's that chart on the Bloomberg showing the analyst ratings on Apple right now. Um, what about AI? Apple, we just talked about this a little bit earlier mm -hmm. with Kai-Fu Lee. Apple seems to be a bit behind when it comes to AI vis-a-vis -vis the other tech giants. Does that matter? Um, at this point, it doesn't matter. But what I'd also say is Apple was n never the first with anything out there, right? Uh, Palm, if you recall, actually came up with the first personal digital assistance, which Apple eventually improved upon with iPhone. So I would argue Apple's never been the first to market. They've just been the best to market. Uh, so let's say if there's a viable AI case for consumers. I'm sure Apple will figure a way to play in it. And what about cars? I mean, we, we know Apple is working on something car related. We don't know what it is. We don't know how well it's going. Yeah, uh, again, it, it's, it's unclear not only are they working on cars as a physical car that me and you would drive, or are they working on a car OS, the operating system. Uh, but Apple, given the size they have, given the innovation that they have, it's logical for them to invest and look at all these different, different options, much as they did at the big Apple TVs 10 years ago, which never came to market. So, so bottom line is controlling for everything else. You say Apple's going to get to a trillion in short order simply because of the iPhone 8 and simply because of these buybacks. Exactly. All right. Amit Daryanani, thanks so much for joining us, Thank analyst you. at RBC. All right, well, Apple and Visa are both facing claims by a small Boston area company that their mobile payment partnership infringes on four of its patents. Universal Secure Registry says it sent Apple a series of letters in 2010 describing its patented technology and seeking a partnership long before Apple Pay's debut. Apparently, the company also pursued a partnership with Visa around the same time. Both Apple and Visa declined the offers of a partnership. Coming up, inside Facebook's strategy for moderating offensive and violent posts, we will dig into how the company is working to remove certain material from the platform this is Bloomberg. A stock we are watching, shares of the action camera maker GoPro, almost 8% rise in the session double the amount of usual volume that is the biggest move since March. Investors will hear from the company at JP Morgan's Global Tech Conference on Tuesday. And another stock we're watching take a look at the Bloomberg here, Take Two Interactive is down over 9% post market trading. The Rockstar Games publisher saying it is delaying the release of Red Dead Redemption 2 to the spring of 2018. It was previously planned for release in the fall of this year. Facebook has created a rule book for its moderators to use when censoring possibly offensive posts from its nearly 2 billion users. This according to a new report from The Guardian. The social network has been under pressure for failing to prevent the circulation of violent images and hate speech and recently said it would add 3,000 employees to review obscene posts. The Guardian obtained copies of thousands of slide and slides and photos that the company shared with moderators last year as guidelines. Joining us now, Sarah Fryer, our Bloomberg Tech reporter who covered Facebook. This is a really interesting report. What's your main takeaway here? I think this is fascinating to us because all of these things have happened behind the scenes in this sort of black box where we don't know why when Facebook comes back 
from a user report and says, this doesn't violate our community standards. We don't know why they think that. And now here, The Guardian is unmasking some of these standards, which Facebook has not yet confirmed. And, and it's just fascinating to look at the different things. Like, for example, if I, if I make a credible threat to you, that can be taken down. But if I make sort of a, a throwaway threat that is not specific about when I might hurt you, that's fine. So yeah, let's take a look at some of these. They're a little confusing. Videos of violent death may be allowed if used to create awareness around issues like mental health. Images of child abuse are removed if it's shared with, quote, sadism and celebration. Otherwise, it can re remain and be remarked as disturbing. Animal abuse is allowed, but may be need to be classified as disturbing. Thought it was worth it to mention the specifics because some of these moderators are saying they have 10 seconds to decide whether to remove it. Right. And these are kind of intense calculations that need to be made in that time. Very intense calculations. And I think that that is one reason why Facebook realizes that it's incredibly understaffed in these efforts and adding all those people around the world, the 3,000 employees that you mentioned, these are hard decisions and these are very human decisions. These are ones that they cannot yet tackle with artificial intelligence. And they're counting on these, on these workers, in many cases contractors, to make these calls about what should be, what should remain on this network. And it is a difficult call because some of those, some of those things you mentioned sound like they shouldn't belong on Facebook, right? They sound really creepy or, or violent. I wouldn't um, want to see them in my feed. Absolutely. I wouldn't either. But the company is trying to, to refrain from being any sort of censor. Uh, I mean, they certainly censor quite a bit, but they don't want to cross that line where they're preventing people from expressing themselves on the platform and driving users away. Meantime, Mark Zuckerberg is on his state-by-state -state tour. Right now, there's been a lot of speculation about whether he'll run for president, run for some kind of public office. He actually posted about this saying, some of you have asked if this means I'm running for public office. I'm not. I'm doing it to get a broader perspective to make sure we are best serving our community. He also talked a little bit about how uh, he's gathering research uh, for whether Facebook should be more involved in telling you people you should know rather than simply connecting to you to people you do know. Uh, right. What do you make of this? Right. So Zuckerberg has talked a lot this year about creating meaningful connections in, in people's groups, things that make them feel like Facebook is a helpful resource to them as opposed to uh, the, the network that exposes them to the violent acts and, and angry things that we just talked about with the Guardian report. Uh, Zuckerberg saying that this trip is all about a revelation for what he, can, what he can do with the platform, I actually think it's a little bit more than that. I mean, Facebook's biggest problem right now, it's not in the financials, it's in the company's public image. They've been dealing with these issues like, like fake news and fake accounts and extremist propaganda. They've been dealing with quite a bit from regulators in Europe over privacy, and Zuckerberg needs to go out there and be a politician. Right. Whether it's for running for office down the line or not, Zuckerberg needs to reshape Facebook's image as something that can be a force for good in the world. And by the way, he's giving the commencement speech at Harvard later this week, so we will be monitoring that. Sarah Fryer, who covers Facebook for Bloomberg Tech, thanks so much for joining us. Coming up, we take a look at the state of cybersecurity after the ransomware WannaCry breach spread around the globe. The advice a leader in cyber defense has for you next. This is Bloomberg. Cybersecurity has been dominating the headlines from the hacking of the Democratic National Committee in 2016 to the ransomware attack that hit the globe earlier this month. And companies in the industry are reaping the benefits, including CrowdStrike, the provider of digital security, aided the DNC in its response to what is believed to be interference by Russia. It also just announced it's raised $100 million in new capital. Joining us now from New York, George Kurtz, CrowdStrike CEO and co-founder. George, great to have you back here on the show. Let's start with WannaCry. What is the latest info you have on who's behind it and the actual extent of the damage? Well, I think what we saw with WannaCry is uh, a failure of the traditional uh, legacy 
uh, AV manufacturers and, and we saw a large scale infection. Who's behind it? I think there's a lot of researchers, including ourselves, trying to sort that out. I think it's, too early, it's still too early to tell. Uh, but when you look at the impact, I think it clearly highlights the need for uh, technology that goes beyond what was done 30 years ago in pure signature based uh, uh, endpoint technology designed to identify this. And that was one of the challenges that we've seen here and that's why so many computers were actually infected. There's been a lot of finger pointing Microsoft to the NSA, the government, to companies like Microsoft. What do you make of the idea that you know Microsoft claims that the NSA should have been doing more to warn the private sector about zero day vulnerabilities? Well, you have to kind of separate these out. The governments who operate in the, in the cyber battlefield are, are going to do what they do. They're going to look for vulnerabilities. They're going to look to exploit those, and that's just going to happen. I think what's most important is that companies and individuals need to make sure that they have the latest patches and certainly that they have the latest protection in place, things like artificial intelligence-driven endpoint technology that can actually identify these sort of attacks without actually having signatures created in advance. Now. CrowdStrike, as I mentioned, is, you know, you guys are the ones that discovered Russian interference in the DNC. Have you seen any change in Russian cyber activity in the United States? Well, whether it's Russia, whether it's uh, any of the Middle Eastern countries, or whether it's uh, e-crime, um, they're all formidable adversaries, and they continue to come up with new and innovative ways and techniques to try to get into companies, siphon data out. Um, data is a new weapon, so not only getting in, but being able to release and dump that data, uh, and certainly use that data to extract more money. Uh, Enterprise-wide ransomware, WannaCry is a good example. Um, so they just keep getting better and better uh, as, the, as the good guys begin to tighten the noose and be able to identify them. So it's an ever-changing environment, and that's why people need to remain vigilant. Okay, but what about Russia in particular? Do you see any connection between the cyber activity and the revelations that have been happening in Washington out of the White House? Well, I think there's always a lot of activity, whether it's in the U.S. or whether it's outside. Um, obviously, Russia has uh, incredible capabilities. And uh, like most governments, they're going to look to leverage those capabilities across uh, data exfiltration, uh, intelligence gathering, uh, you know, in some cases, perhaps leaking that data out on the Internet for political purposes. So where else might we see Russia being active this year? Any activity in Europe around the elections, for example? Well, I think as was reported in the past, uh, there was some re uh, reports about Russian activity in some of the elections. Um, you know, and again, I think uh, if you have... Uh, a capable adversary, I think people need to be uh, thinking about their own security, thinking about their own risk management policies and making sure that they have the appropriate security controls and protection in place to identify not just malware but the, the breach activity which is most important. And again, I think that's where a lot of companies have fallen down just trying to focus on the malware, not looking at the entire breach cycle. Now, you said you're open to small acquisitions that might complement what you already do. What kinds of acquisitions might we expect, like threat detection technology, threat intelligence technology? Well, I think it, since we have such a broad platform that looks a lot like Salesforce for endpoint security, anything that might tuck in and allow us to create a new application that rides on top of that platform, I think would be a good fit. We spent a lot of time to build the underpinnings uh, and the technology itself, which has been very well received by our customers. So we want to continue on that path. And if we can add new capabilities, we'll continue to do that. Uh, we continue to look at aqua hires. Uh, we spent a lot of time building our own artificial intelligence capabilities, and we look to add to those across across the platform to provide even more robust uh, prevention and detection capabilities for our customers. And where are you expecting CrowdStrike to expand geographically? Well, there's been a, a, a massive expansion already. I mean, just from our C round to our D round, we've added 400 people. We've expanded into Europe. We've gone from four offices to 15 offices. We've expanded into Asia Pacific, uh, Australian office. We opened an office in South America. Uh, so we continue to fill that out, and we've just seen such a spike in demand that we want to make sure that we can service those customers that are locally. And security is a local uh, sale. You have to be there and you have to show up and you have to make sure that you're looking at the local threats, being able to make sure that you have the right protection for those customers. All right. George Kurtz, CEO and co-founder of CrowdStrike, thanks so much for joining us today. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Remember all episodes live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg.